was, okay, there you go. You want to begin again? Okay, it says Charles has expressed interest in web development as a career, even though he has not gained any real world real world training or experience in this pursuit. So which of the following resources would be most helpful for a member of the admission review and dismissal committee to provide to Charles and his family? Um, I so I'm going to take out my, my annotating thing really quickly, because uh, right away as you were reading, um, I saw that even though this, even though business, even though he doesn't have that, that's what he expressed his interest in. And he has these all these other issues and, and anxieties, but he wants to do this. So if he doesn't, if he hasn't had any real world training or experience, then I would make it the top of my priority as the special ed um, teacher, you know, to try to find ways to get him real world training and experience in this web, you know, development. Just just without reading the answer choices is what I would say. So what were you going to say, Samantha? So I was thinking A, enrollment in a seminar teaching attendees how to start and grow their own web development business. And then I thought C, which is a list of colleges and universities that offer online degrees in web development. But I, but he suffers from extreme anxiety when dealing with the unexpected. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? Like when you suffer from, I, I mean, I suffer from anxiety, but for different, you know, different things. But what does that mean? Like from the unexpected, like. I guess from the unknown, from the um, decision making in non-school settings and anxiety dealing with the unexpected so um and the unexpected is essentially life you, you know what I mean um so things that aren't uh planned and whatnot and so between your choices and then given what they've said given his interest and the fact that um online degrees are not real world training or experience um, I believe attending, uh, enroll in a seminar teaching attendees how to start and grow their own. Because if he doesn't like uh, the unexpected, if he's working in any type of setting, there's going to be things that are unexpected. You know, different things happen every day, different problems, different issues that you might, you know, encounter. And you have all, you have to deal with all these different people in your job. However, if you're developing your own business, then you can sort of structure things to limit the unexpected, you know, to limit um, instances that might be triggering um, for this autistic boy. Um, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, it so would I, I would say A is the best answer. Because uh, look at C, even though C is like, it's, it's an okay answer. You know, that is something we should do. You, you should do for him as well. Like I said, they give you several appropriate things that you should do. One is more appropriate or the better answer than the others based on specific things that they, that they have said. So um, the list of colleges and universities that offer online degrees in web development um is a good thing to do for him, but it's not going to give him that real world training or experience in that pursuit. So they gave us that little bit of knowledge. And then they also gave us that little bit of knowledge that says that he suffers from extreme anxiety, dealing with the unexpected. So maybe, um, I'm not saying that, um, and it's online degree, so he, he can do that. But which one of these would would um, help him, you know, with anxiety and also give him real world training and experience? Yeah, so it would be A, because he would be able, like, to create his own. First, he would be with other attendees and then he would be able to, like you said, grow his own uh, business and he could control the expected. So he wouldn't get anxiety from the unexpected. 
Right. Um, and, and and you certainly would want to, let me see, and he's a junior. Uh, well, I don't know. Let, let me see. Express interest in my career. Yeah, I like that. To provide them the best resource, most helpful thing was if we could provide him with a teaching seminar, that would be the best thing, you know, um, it, because it's not like for you know, a grade or anything like that. It's kind of limited pressure. Seminars are not like, um, you know, in class, uh, university it's just you go there and listen kind of like church you know um not a lot of talking uh, as far as like in between the the participants or the attendees so uh, typically something that he, he could do it wouldn't be super unexpected um i still like a better but i do think that it's important that we also provide him with a list of colleges and universities that offer that degree, but I wouldn't, you know, I would do that, but certainly I would want to get him some real world experience to see if this is something he even really likes. Yeah. Expressed an interest in it to have him do enroll him. And that would be, we are providing it for him because look how it reads. It says, which of the following resources? So which is better? Would you rather give him a list of colleges or enroll him in a seminar? Enroll him in the seminar. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it's A. Okay. For sure. I wasn't sure, but okay. Good that I had chosen A or C. Okay. Let me go on to the next one. Oh, I have to delete that, right? Remember, one is better than the other based on the words that are there. Based on the words. Okay. So if we went back and looked at, if we said like the goal is like, which is the best resource? Said to ourselves, which is the best resource? Then immediately we could just say like, okay, well, this is as a resource, this one's better. Okay. Oh. Oh, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Slacking on my erasing game. Okay, so I went back and read this one. And well, I had put D, but then I changed it to A um, for- so, or, tell, let, tell me, break it down for me. Let me know oh, what, okay. what you said and why. Yeah, let me okay. know like what your keywords and phrases were and, and what you- Okay, so I read that she's a first grade student with a specific learning disability. And it's- um, I'm going to mispronounce this word, but I need you to help me pronounce it. Dyscalculia? Yeah, How dyscalculia. Dyscalculia. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so during mathematics, and then Maddie's class is working on adding, on adding two-digit and one-digit numbers. One strategy that Maddie's special education suggests to support Maddie in learning addition with the general education classroom is first I thought so what was the goal say say the goal for me what's the teacher's goal the teacher's goal in this question like you know what's the question asking for is um on adding on addition her goal is to learn addition in the general education classroom yeah she wants to keep her in general ed and support her in learning adding two digit and one digit numbers so like 13 plus five right mm -hmm. so first i had put have her next to a peer but then it was wrong um to double check her work with them for accuracy and um, then I had changed my mind. Well, when I reread it, I was like, um, another thing could be graph paper to help her keep track of the placement of the numbers. Absolutely. Because, I would say you know, I don't want to give her an answer key because, you know, it's not going to help her. No, no, and, that's not going to be a, I mean, that's 
not going to be useful for her as far as learning to do it, maybe checking for answers afterwards, but even then it's not, that's not a useful support for Maddie, not the most, you know, beneficial for sure. So I would say for sure C is not the answer. We could bet ourselves $5. It's not. And what about B? B, it, it's just not the answer because you have to know the definition of, of dyscalculia because it, it is a math related uh, vocabulary word and this one is Absolutely. A, to not worry about Maddie's part it's like if I didn't know what it meant if I wasn't right. sure what it meant I would have maybe picked that one you know if I wasn't sure like no no I think it means something else um that one's just silly it's it's not the right you know, it's not the correct one. Sure, you can pay yourself five dollars. It's not the answer because dyscalculia is specifically a learning disability with math. <laughs> so yeah. it would be like against the law for us not to track the progress and and try to support her in that area that she is, you know, suffers from an identified disability. So we can bet ourselves B is not the answer for sure. So process of elimination would tell us, and then we know because she can see visual visually by you know shading in or placing x marks or whatever the case may be with the graphing paper um the numbers you know what i mean correlate that with the with the graphing paper mm -hmm. so why wouldn't we have her sit next to a peer to double check her work with them for accuracy well the peer i mean the peer's just going to be doing theirs on their paper like you know, 13 plus five, and they'll look over and they might see, oh, well, her, it's, it would be the exact same as having a um, answer key next to them. Oh, okay. Okay. It's as I just thought peer, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so you might, you, you, you think, oh yeah, for sure. But, but because it's just calcul, uh, calcul, calculia, hold on, let me look it up. Um, Oh, wait. Um, my stuff is so slow. Okay, so um, it, it specifically affects an individual ability to do basic arithmetic, such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, it take, with adults, it takes off longer when working with numbers and they're prone to making like basic calculation mistakes. Um, And they say dyscalculia, it's it's a comorbid, which means that it exists with other disorders. Um, it's often a comorbid disorder with Asperger's syndrome and Asperger's. So, so specifically, those um, students might also um, suffer from that comorbidity of dyscalculia, where they, um, you know, well, oh my goodness, where did you go? Okay, hold on. Okay, hold on, why is it not working? Oh, good Lord. It made it small, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Okay, can you just get back? Goodness, I apologize. No, it's fine. It's like tiny, like my screen, it's so it's so tiny and I can't see anything. It's like oh, hold on, let me see why. Like what you're seeing of mine. 
yeah like my whole zoom screen is like it it went into this like little microscopic and i don't know why it did that like it just did that make it different? no it's no. it's not on your end it's like it's totally on my end if i were to show you you would laugh it's ridiculous in fact i'm gonna just We can log out and log back in if you want. Um, we might have to because I okay. don't know what I can't get it to be like I just sent you a picture of it because it's funny. Um, so let's do that. I'm gonna just log off and go back on and then it'll be hopefully a normal size screen again because I don't know what's happening. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's end it. And okay. Stop video. Oh, okay. Oh, it's big. It's big again. It's big. Oh. I got it. I got it. It's big. Okay. Wait. What did I do? Okay. I put. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yeah. I can see it. It's okay. perfect. I can see it now. Okay. So now, um, yeah, that. Um, so we're good to go on that one. Yeah. Um, Having a peer would be the, you know, the equivalent to uh, like a talking answer sheet. Mm, okay. Next. And not really help them visualize things and see how addition and, and subtraction work, you know? Yeah. Because the numbers and everything will get so jumbled. Okay. So this one. I don't know why I put it. My my father suffered from seizures, and I have no idea. And the first thing you do when somebody suffers from a seizure is to put something in their in their mouth so they don't swallow their tongue. And, you know, put them to the side or, you know, things like that. And I don't know why I put immediately go get the nurse. And um, I changed it to a put something hard between the student's teeth. So he doesn't swallow his tongue. That's the right one, right? Um, actually, that is not. The, oh, it's not. No, I don't think that that's the correct. Uh, it used to be. You're right, but I don't think that it is. I think now because I've had a couple of students, and if I'm not mistaking the training that we received. Um, and the thing is, is that it changes, right? It, it things change as we learn you know, science gets better and we learn how the body works better. It used to be for concussions that they would not let you sleep. And now we know that's detrimental. Your brain needs to heal and you literally can't be reading anything or watching TV or even like li listening to music. They want you in a dark room with your eyes closed and just be resting your brain so that healing can happen. So um, I believe with epilepsy, um, it used to be, um, you know, a couple of decades ago that you would put something hard in between the, um, the teeth. Yeah. And, you know, you didn't, the, the fear was that they would swallow their tongue. And now the fear is that they will fall and hit their heads, um, mm. and, and get an injury from that or hit their heads on something nearby. So it is to make sure that the, you can put the child, uh, lie the child down where they can't hit their head. Um, and, and that there's nothing around them that can hurt them and send someone to get the nurse, you know, um, uh, if you can't get an adult, you know, send a, a classmate to get an adult to get help, but, you know, send someone to get the nurse, but the, First and foremost would be that make sure um, that you place them on the ground. Like if they're sitting in the desk, um, you know, and they slump in their chair or, you know, in, in, you know, sitting at a table and they slump in their chair or whatever the case may be, that you um, sort of move the desks around from them and make mm -hmm. sure that that something is underneath, um, you know, between the floor and okay, they won't hit their head yes yes okay you know what i am just gonna double check really quickly i'm pretty sure that that is you can go on to the next um one and I'll, i'm just calling my mom who used to be the director of nurses and uh, for mission isd for many many years she's retired now um she would know what the newest protocol is so 
to type like this. Mm, she didn't answer, but I'll let you know later. But I'm I'm pretty sure that that is the correct answer. So this one, I did have a little bit of trouble. Um, I did change it to D. So Richard is, he's an eighth grade student and he's autistic. And at his annual IEP meeting, Richard's parents expressed a desire to dismiss him for, from speech therapy services, services since he has no trouble speaking, since he has no trouble speaking clearly. Gosh, I can't speak right now. And they're concerned that his weekly sessions with the campus speech therapist are causing him to fall behind in his classes. The speech therapist has previously told Richard's case manager that their sessions focus on intentionally teaching Richard how to interpret, interpret the facial expressions and body language of others and how to positive, positively engage in the social interactions through reciprocal reciprocal mm -hmm. communication, which is the best response to Richard's, which is the best response to Richard's parents' concerns. So first I put accept the parents' recommendation without dissent, since they know their child better than anyone else. And they do know their child, but it's also the speech therapist also knows their child so I had I put D encourage the speech therapist to share the data that me, that measures Richard's ability to engage in and maintain a conversation and how their sessions aim to help him build this skill mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Because A is not the correct answer. It didn't say anything about, you know, um, trouble making friends. I mean, it does say that the speech therapist, you know, um, has mentioned particular things, but not about like making friends, struggling to make friends. Like that was never mentioned. So that is not the answer. Producing data that proves Richard's academic performance is not suffering due to this weekly speech therapy sessions. I don't think that that is the correct answer as well. Um, you want to, instead of proving, oh, you're, you're wrong that it's affecting, instead, you need to encourage the speech therapist, first of all, to share the data with the parents better, um, you know, and sort of uh, figure out a way to better utilize their time to build the skill, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would say you're right. D is the correct answer based on um, So how are you feeling? Are you feeling more, um, you know, like for this one, you read it again. And now that you know how to, now you know how to read them. Um, you know, are you, do you feeling more confident in that oh. you'll be able to, you know, hello? Yeah, no, no, no. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, I, like you said, you're like, if you need to hear, like, if I need to hear your voice in my head when I'm reading the questions for in the exam, you know, reread them, find the keywords, you know, read all the answers, all the questions, you know, all the answers for the questions. Yes. And, you know, um, if I need to skip, like, when I did this exam, I didn't skip any of them. So when I do the actual exam, they let you skip questions, I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. They yeah, do. so I'm not going to just focus on one for like 10 or 15 minutes. I'll just skip it and then come back to it without, you know, thinking, oh, is it this one or is it that one? Then, you know. And when I'm you get it down to those last two, ask yourself, which one of these best addresses the goal I identified? And every single time for every question, say, ask yourself, what's the goal here? Like, what's the goal for the special education teacher? What's the goal? 
is it, and the goal here is we want them to be able to interpret facial expressions and body language and positively engage in reciprocal communication. And so the but one that that best supports that, like uh, B doesn't do that at all. Providing them proof that he's not suffering academically doesn't really like uh, even address where he's at, his parents' concerns, none of that. Um, so D is the best answer. Ask yourself, what is the goal? And if you get caught between two answer choices, go back and say, which one of these better is better for my keywords? Which one of them addresses, you know, the majority of the keywords and phrases that I found? If you find two big chunks that need to be included, like they're looking for, you know, um, facial expressions and, you know, reciprocal communication, well, then the answer choice needs to, you know, sort of address both of those things better. Okay, I'm going to the next one. Excellent. Uh, okay, this one, you know, one thing that I am worried about the exam is the math portion. I'm not good at math like this one I put a set of rectangles and then I'm still like what do I click and then I just put that was a guy put a question mark and I was and I'm like let me ask Stephanie if it's right I put a set of squares now so that's a problem it's like math is just I'm not good at, I've never been good at math well, everyone can can be good at math. Math is the universal language. It's the language that all the world uses universally and in the same way. It functions in that same way. It's just that somewhere along the line in your instruction, you did not get the support that you needed. And everybody feels that way along the line in their math instruction. I felt it that way, but my dad was a math teacher. So anytime I needed extra support in my learning instruction, oh no, where did you go? One moment, I'm gonna bring it back up. Don't want, don't know what's happening. Hold on, it went small again. <laughs> Oh, it did? Hold on. I don't know why. Did I go back? Let me see. Uh. Last time I had put stop video and then you said it worked right away and then I put start video. Let me do the stop video thing. Did I go back? Mm -mm. Hold on one second. How did I do it last time? I did something because it, it went away like, like, I don't even know. Oh, hold on. Let me do. Uh, um, do, do, do. Hold on one second. Got it back. Okay, got it. I don't know why it does that, but I got it back. Okay, so anyway, my point is, is that somewhere along in your math instruction, you needed extra support. Everybody, and, and it's the case in, in math all along, every new math, um, you know, unit, you're learning new skills, new formulas, new theorems. And so if there are weak spots or holes that go unmended, then it becomes very complicated later on as things become more complex. And so everybody has difficulty when they're first learning the new concepts. It's just someone being there to help them in the way that they learn and, and give them the support that they need. And you didn't get that. So you can still be good at math. So let's take a look at this. We have Miss Johnson is teaching spatial reasoning. And that is like the way that we understand like, the uh, space and, and things and objects and, and the way that they take up the world and shape space to her eighth grade resource math class. 
So we already got some, some major keywords. We're doing spatial re reasoning and we know that it's middle age group, um, which is eighth grade and that it's a resource math class. She wants to incorporate technology. Okay, so she, her one of her goals is to incorporate technology. So she finds a program that allows users to design a room. Her students create their dream bedrooms using 3D software. And then they print the bedroom designs and the furniture on separate papers. The students then move the furniture around the room until they like the designs. What shapes can the students use to recreate the furniture below? So remember, it's 3D software. So which one of these would be best for 3D? Which one of these are 3D shapes? A s no, a square, no. Trapezoid, hexagon, no. I have no idea. Hold on one second, I'm gonna I'll pull all of them. Trapezoid. Okay, so. Oh, gee, Wallace. Here, here we are. Okay, so 2D shapes are circles. And an example of its like pairing would be a sphere. A sphere is a 3D representation of a circle, right? Mm -hmm. So you have semicircle, flat shape, triangle is flat. Um, a pyramid is, is sort of like a 3D representation of a triangle. Um, and then you have uh, squares, which is a flat. An example of, you know, 3D model for a square would be a cube. Yeah. Um, and then you have um, a cuboid. And a cuboid kind of looks like a rectangle, but in, three, in 3D. Um, what is it that we were looking for? You have triangles, squares, pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, octagon, nonagon, decagon, uh, hendecagon. Those are all uh, flat 2Ds. 3D shapes are sphere, cylinder, cube, cuboid, cone, triangular prism hexagonal prism. Um, one that I didn't see here was trapezoid. Let me see where I can find one that includes Okay, so um, they are trapezoids. It's kind of like difficult to explain. I'm gonna try to draw it for you so you can see it. And it like, it might be useful. Um, I Googled it and I'm seeing the shape here. Okay, so it's like this would be one example like of a type of trapezoid it's like a rectangle but it has a slope like it has an angled edge at one edge so i mean you could use these shapes to bend and make like a dresser and a chair and a desk you know what i mean if you got these papers mm -hmm. um but you would have to give them several i, I need to go back up and read um because i'm kind of a little bit lost i know it's a 3d model um and a trapezoid is not um 3d it's a 2d shape you know but mm -hmm. but they're they're creating it they're using 3d software and they want to recreate that 3d-ness i think on the paper is that what they're saying yeah so i would say trapezoids would be the best for 
shape for them to create a 3D paper thing. So the students then move the furniture around the room until they like the shapes. Oh no, the designs. What shapes can the students use to recreate the furniture below? To recreate it. Yeah, trapezoids. Yeah, I would say trapezoids is the correct answer. That is a really difficult question, just so you know. That's like, don't feel bad about your math skills or anything like, don't be ridiculous because I was kind of challenging a little bit, you know? First of all, you have to know the difference between 2D and, and, and 3D and then which ones are there. And then realize that they're asking you to recreate that 3D-ness from 2D objects. Which yeah, is a no, I, I just get worried because I'm like, if I don't know math or if I don't know these questions, how am I gonna teach my kids you are going to do just fine because you're going to have the teacher um, textbook and it's going to give you the examples and you're going to remember it and it's going to be easy and so you're going to be teaching your kids and reviewing and you're going to become an expert i'm telling you i taught for 16 years and i think by like year oh i don't know four or something i had large swaths of english literature just wholly memorized because every day I would, you know, read pieces and read poems year after year, you know, class period after class period. So I had, when I taught, you know, ninth grade English for, I don't know, four or five years, I had all of Romeo and Juliet memorized, like whole sonnets, like whole thing. And the kids thought I was a genius. I have just been doing it for a really long time. On my first year teaching, I couldn't do any of that stuff. I didn't know any of that stuff. And I and I sort of doubted myself even when I was teaching poetry because I didn't feel, you know, competent enough to, to instruct them on skills. Like I felt competent enough to analyze it myself, but but to instruct those skills and to get them to be able to do those things. And so it takes time. Nobody becomes a master teacher in one year, not, not even the people that come from the university and that went through the different, what is it called that they call them? Um, not the, the clinical things where they go and they teach um, for the university. Um, anyway, and no, nobody gets it easy and it's challenging. So you'll, you'll be able to do it. You will... Um, you know, nobody's going to make you figure this out on your first try. You're going to have a mentor that's going to tell you, we have this cool software and use these, this shape and they can bend it and blah, 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 to make, you know, little 3D models of their, their thing. So um, I would say maybe a set of trapezoids. No, I said a trapezoids, right? Yeah. Um, what was it? Yeah, I say trapezoids for sure. They're all, all of those are 2D and trapezoids seems better. Okay. Thank that you. That was a tough question. Thank you for the advice though. Absolutely. Okay, so this one, this one, I just put a question mark on it because I was like, nope, it's math again. <sighs> Okay, so let's see. We have student groups are given six-sided die, okay, with each side labeled a number, so one through six. Each student rolls the die 75 times. So each student does it 75 times and records the number that is rolled. If there are eight groups of students participating in this activity, which of the following is the most likely, is most likely the total number of times a four was rolled? All right, so this is one of those questions that we have to put in 75 times, hold on. Let's see, we have to put it in an equation. Yeah. So um, we have six and they do it 75 times. There's eight, each student group, each, see that's important, I misread that. I said each student, each student group. So that means eight, 
me see. I'm gonna have to um it's Chihuahuas. It's not like me. I'm gonna do it on my piece of paper. I'll be here. So it is the operation ones. Seven five. Um, I see. Okay, so help me out here. We're, we're doing this together. If okay. there are eight groups of students and each one does it, um, that activity, um, 75 times. So mm -hmm. it is 75, is it 75 X or it's eight times. 75 equals I need to do because it's like order operation probability it's a probability and I'm just having to ref like with refresh my my memory So because it's a fair dice, each side is likely to appear um, in any, any given role. Um, let me see. Oh, okay, so let me see. Okay, so if we roll the die, the probability of us getting, because remember, this is a probability question, the probability of us getting a, uh, oh, uh, let me draw. I'm gonna do it with a thinner one. Let me see if this is not too bad. So the probability of us getting any one number, because it's equal, right? Like the, the theory of probability says that if we, fair probability, if we throw the dice, we have like equal, equal probability. There's no like, um, there's not a heavier side to like the two on the die or the six, right? It's just like, each side has an equal probability of landing and being shown. And because of that, it's represented one. So each toss is represented as one six. Every toss has a one six, like each number has one six probability of coming out, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So number four has one six probability of you know, coming out. And we threw it 75 times. So one of these times 75, right? Mm -hmm. And there's eight groups. So this occurred, you know, times eight after everything is happening after everything's happened it's this is multiplied eight times 
Um, so if we wanted to do it in like orders of, um, it would be, well, we're looking for the four. We'll just do, we're looking for any numbers because each one has the same, you know, probability. Um, but I'm I'm trying I'm trying to make sure that I have this correct. Yeah, that's correct. So we're looking for x, which is four. We, we it is four, but x any one of these. So um, X is on one side and we have one six. So we need to multiply this like this over one. So that's 75 over one times one six. And you could do it on a, on a calculator. Um, Oh my goodness, what the heck? Nothing is working. Which is 12.5 times eight. And it's a hundred. So which one of these is closer to a hundred? So what I did here, and this was 75 because it was 75 uh and i'm so sorry you know what i'm gonna just erase this because it's so ugly i'm gonna try again my poor students um okay so x was the number that we're looking for which is four right we already know that's the number we want to know about mm -hmm. but that's however many one time so each time we roll it the number has the you know whatever number comes out has equal probability like this uh and we rolled it 75 times big 75 um and all 75 is is 75 over one right and that's all i did i did 75 over one and i just uh multiplied across the top and it became 75 divided by six equals i don't know why it's slanted you have to forgive me my goodness um, and that equals um, 12.5. But that's only one group, remember? And we have eight. eight groups. So this needs to be multiplied by eight. And when you do that, it equals to 100. And since this is probability, we don't have to have an exact answer. It is like statistically impossible for us, you know, to get it correct each time, but around a hundred times you should expect to get a four rolled. So it would be 98, eh? that's, that's correct. That is correct. Okay, let me, where was it? Okay, so I'm gonna click next. Sorry, I just popped out for one second. Okay. Get a water. Erase this. All right. Okay, so this one I changed it to a uh because it says a special education teacher is working on reinforcing foundational reading skills in order to support her students literacy development she writes the letter h on on the board and makes the h sound she asks the she asks the class to name as many words as they can that start with the letter H. Which of the following is this activity most focused on improving? I would say you're correct. A is correct. Phonemic awareness. She is she is focusing on the sound. How many how many words begin with the sound? And then they would say hat, hop, 
hot hurricane or whatever you know yeah so if let's just say this was b or uh c or d it would be the same answer if there are, if the question says uh the teacher wants her students like um she writes letter h on the board and she wants that sound to make that sound it would mm-hmm. be phonemic right is it is yes, that how you it would, yes it would be for, yeah it would be phonemic awareness right so print awareness remember we spoke about that and that's about like spacing um graphemes like writing the the letters understanding like this the 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 way that letters are sort of like spaced in a word and then words are spaced in a sentence and um you know periods punctuation all of that um you know you if she were if the special education teacher were giving them a list of you know 10 common words for them to uh you know identify and read for her to review um you know over a period of you know a week or two weeks, you know, assessing them, their ability to, to read those words on her lists, then um, that would be word awareness would be sight words, you know, there's specific lists, and it sort of like happens over and over again, then she, he, there. um, And, and we give these sight words and, and have them practice recognizing them so that when they read them, they don't have to sound out. E. then they they see they oh that's she right away um so that would be word awareness so yeah it's certainly phonemic awareness okay next okay okay this one i chose those three but then i went back and I just took off, um, what is it? I just took off A and I just picked B and D. Mm-hmm. Reading aloud and participating in a whole class discussion after reading the text. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, both of those A and D so and choral reading is such a great great um, strategy I don't feel like enough teachers utilize it Um, especially those trying to improve oral language skills because it's a really low risk um, scenario where you can practice articulating the language right utilizing making those phonemes repeating how things are are after obviously the teacher has modeled the oral reading but it's really great for the students um for for several reasons and in several content areas so the choral reading i'm an incredibly huge fan and i would say a and d are are the best answer choices which ones you said a and d yes a and d oh i put uh b and d so right Wait, hold on. Yeah, I said B and D because so it's A and D then. Right. So participating in a discussion after the reading isn't choral reading. So choral reading is all like together. Um, when when you read, um, I'll give you the exact. I want to give you like the exact definition. Um, is reading aloud in unison? as a whole class or as a group so um you know you can read especially with like the little ones but even with the older ones you know with the junior high kids seventh eighth graders um reading a children's book or having a children's book and reading it to them and then having them choral read with you or choral read things along with you is a great way to have them practice the language um, and and practice articulating the language, but so they have to listen and they also have to say it aloud with you. So um, choral reading and choral like recitation would be like, okay, 
metamorphosis. Okay, now everybody say metamorphosis with me. And then everybody says metamorphosis. And we all say it together. But choral reading is we all read it together. We all read the sentences together. Um, maybe we read the poem together. Um, typically, you don't want to read too large chunks together, but choral reading is an excellent um, strategy. It helps students build fluency. It helps them build self-confidence. Like I said, self-confidence. If they mess up while they're reading, it's no big deal. Everybody's saying it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, they are, they, but they can correct themselves and maybe you do it the next time. Maybe you're reading the same story, choral reading a couple of times to give them practice. So if they messed it up the first time, then the second time, chances are they're gonna uh, pronounce it during choral reading, uh, you know, without that miscue. So um, it also helps with motivation. They get more fluent and it helps them with motivation. Yeah, for sure. Because if everyone's doing it, I'm not, you know, if it's not just me, I'm more willing to participate. We're all doing it. It's fun. We're all reading it together. I'm trying not to um, mess up as I'm reading. Because I know that choral reading has been a strat teaching strategy since I was a child. And I remember really enjoying choral reading and being hard on myself as a student if I, if, the, if, I, if I did a miscue, like if I mispronounced, I misread something or like I skipped to a different sentence while I was following along in choral reading. Um, so I always tried to like do it perfectly. I was sort of an overachiever, but it is a really good strategy for students to self-monitor themselves as well, like to hear themselves as they read um, and, and monitor their, you know, be like conscious of, they're reading because they're being loud about it and they're saying it out loud and following along, but not self-conscious in their reading because everybody's making all that noise together. Okay. Let me go on to the next one. Okay. So you can do it in small groups. You can do whole groups, small groups and with your student in pairs. You can have them do it in pairs together. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, which is not, see, not in bold, Ooh. I mean, in uh, capital letters, not an example of augmentative and alternative communication, which is ACC. So augmentative and alternative communication. We know with its acro based on its acronym that it is something that is particularly a thing, right? A, a, a thing augmentative. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what it means. It's with specifics to it, but I know that augmenting means to change. Augmentative means it changes communication, and alternative means that it's different. So this is an alternative, different communication that sort of changes it and allows for communication. So um, based on that and my skills of deduction, I'm gonna see augmentative alternative. Um, I put B, I mean, well, I changed it to B. Right. The hearing aids. Okay, and right. so why, why did you eliminate the other ones? Because they were uh, forms of communication and well, hearing aids just, they help you hear better. Like it's Correct. not a form of communication, right? Right. Um, or no. Hold on, let me see. Okay, again, so... Okay, so augmentative and alternative communication, ACCs, um, they're unaided communication systems where like the students can use them and they don't need help in order to get their messages across. Systems that enable communication that relies on the user, the student's body language to deliver the messages. And examples include gestures, eye gaze, vocalization, sign language, and facial expressions. 
So which one of these best um, is not an example of alternative um, augmentative communication? I wasn't right with the implants. Yes, the implants, you're right. Oh, okay. It's not. Yeah, it's not, because we're looking for is not. A, yeah. the sign language is, it's an alternative form of communication. Mm -hmm. It augments normal. It's not normal like where I'm talking and you're listening. It's, uh, and, and I guess cochlear implants, they can um, help you hear communication but it doesn't it's not an augmentative alternative form of communication so um it's gestures eye gaze vocalization sign language and facial expression so the eye eye gaze is for the picture boards so the student can look with its eye at the different pictures and and tell you so that is augmentative alternative communication we know a asl is and um text to speech software applications, does that augment an alternative communication or does it not? Because um, text is also an English language. I I'm just asking. You're asking? Mm -hmm. It is a form of communication. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, absolutely. It is yeah oh no yeah it is yeah it is it is a form of the communication and so a cochlear implant is just like a like a, a what is it called a, a device that is used to help students you know hear but the other ones are alternative forms of communication okay so you were right and you said eye gaze is for picture boards. Right, that's correct. I okay. gave. Okay. Next one. Okay, this one I did have a little bit of trouble on. Okay, which of the following could be considered assistive technology for a physical education class that includes several students with disabilities that impair their movement and force? generation okay so which of the following could be best considered assistive we're looking for assistive to technology so uh, this what are for what is like assistive technology what like some examples like um i well, thought it was like the, the kickball thing I've never heard of the technology um, is something that assists the students do normal movements, you know, accomplish normal um, things. Let me see. Okay, so uh, assisted technology is when you use a tool, any sort of device or tool. So like even a pen is a tool, right? It's a type of technology. Yeah. So assistive technology is any type of tool or technology that helps the students achieve things, uh, their learning objectives. And so I'm assuming that this teacher is, um, you know, trying to help this student these students, um, and they are, have movement impairment, right? Uh, and, and force generation, they can't generate a lot of force. So it will be difficult for them to throw a basketball if the hoop was um, regulation height. But if they were to lower it, it would increase those students that have impaired movement and force generation, the ability to accomplish and, and you know, the motion and complete the task without, um, you know, and, and increase their motivation, self-esteem, practice. So That's I would say lowering the basketball hoop would be ass considered assistive technology. That's the one that I chose. I just wasn't sure. I put a question mark. I put B in a question mark because I was like, 
is it assistive technology? I, yes, I thought I was like. If you can lower it and assist them, then, then absolutely. Okay, so the basketball hoop. Because I was like, the competition scoreboard, I don't think so. I'm like, and then letting the students walk, it doesn't sound, you know, like, um, I mean, you are helping them, but it doesn't sound like um, an assistive technology. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat what you last said? I had to bring the dogs in. Yeah, no, I had uh, agreed with the B. I just, I wasn't too sure, but then we explained it well. And then I was like, C, I was like, I don't know about the competition scoreboard uh, to track the completed exercises. It doesn't really go with the question no for me. how does it help them if they have impaired movement and force they can't generate force behind a ball yeah and then a it, it doesn't really sound i mean uh yes you're letting them walk but it doesn't sound more it just b sounds better like because you're you know helping them you're lowering something instead of like letting them walk instead of running oh. right exactly you're assisting them complete the task without changing the task like they can still complete the task i just used a different technology which was just lowering it mm -hmm. okay let me just click next okay this one i changed it to i changed this one i read it a couple of times I read it probably like three times and I chose C. Okay, so we have um, DAP, gonna get a new student. And we have the learning disability, but in reading comprehension. So we need to make sure to support the student in reading comprehension. Like that should be, you know, the goal for the teacher. Mm -hmm. What steps should they take in order to support that this student that's arriving with reading comprehension? So you said, um, which one? I said I I changed it to C, but still not mm -hmm. too sure. But that's the one that sounds more correct to me now. Like contacting the case manager, request and review the IEP, request and review the student's most recent assessment data in court classes. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why B is not the answer. You don't want to gather low level, high interest, and then just adjust the classroom lighting. Like that's silly. Mm -hmm. B is not the answer. C is you want to contact the people who have been working with this student. Where are they at? do a needs assessment where are they at what's their um progress even further do they have specific interests and then when you get them you ask them do they have specific interests so that you can find them texts to teach the different um you know components of english and reading comprehension or or you know strengthen it using things that they find interesting so that it's more engaging to them and it resonates better inside their brains Okay, let me click the next one. Okay, this one, 504, I changed it to A. Okay. Um. I would say that, um, where did, what did you say? I said A, but D, it was between A or D, but then I chose, I went with A. Yeah, it's D. So it's related, related services. So um, I was even 504 because adults can be 504 too. So while I was pregnant, I was 504. One time while I was you know, teaching, I had a broken toe and I was 504 again. So um, if you have an injury or a limitation to your ability to, 
for us, it's do our job. But for kids, it's to just like exist and be in school, then they can be under that, that supportive section of 504 um, that will give them whatever related services. So for instance, if you are someone, a student and you broke your leg, and there's an elevator and like normally students don't use the elevator. Well, as part of 504, you get to now ride in the elevator, you know? So yeah. we make, there's so many different things that we can do in order to accommodate the students in their different areas because they go through so much um, in order for that, you know, to make sure that they're, they're successful. Okay, so where was I? Okay, so this one, I changed it to, I changed it to A. Mm -hmm. mm. because I wasn't sure about B, about the, uh, the at least two grade levels below. No, and never two levels, no, 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 that wouldn't be the yeah. answer. I mean, it's on grade level, I mean, that changed. It used to be, it was like, they, the committee, the art committee could decide, you know, I have this eighth grade student, but he really reads at like fifth grade. So we're going to test him fifth grade. He's going to take the fifth grade exam. And so, you know, if they were reading at fifth grade or their brains worked at fifth grade, then that's when what, what we tested on. And now, even if their brains work at fifth grade, they still have to take eighth grade. You know, they still have to take yeah. the on grade level exam, which is, you know, terrible for some of them because it's just like setting them up for failure and it's demoralizing. No kid likes to fail or, or not, you know, it's not fun. Anyway, that's not the way to go. Um, I, I would say that the most effective way to ensure that the IEP goals are properly written and implemented is to align them with um, state standards that the student has displayed uh, weakness. You know, we wanna try to help support those weaknesses. And, and, and we want to make sure that those, that, it, that it's over multiple assessment. Like we, it's not just like, oh, we're just saying it off the cuff more like, okay, well, we've seen this, this same issue for like, and, and that's what the R discusses. Like they get the progress reports from the general ed teachers. And if they're struggling with um, things, I got something in my computer and it's like, um, if they're struggling with something and a teacher notices it over extended period, then we discuss like, okay, maybe the, you know, he needs time out, you know, or whatever, because it might be behavioral, it might be academic support, um, various different things that, that they can discuss, but typically it's based on like, what are the current on grade level state standards that they're struggling with that we see that it's like, you know, there's a, a pattern. Mm -hmm. So it would be A. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. See, feeling a little bit more confident. Excellent. Uh, okay, this one I put C, but I put a question mark because I wasn't too sure. Next to, I put a question mark next to C because I wasn't sure. Okay, so let's see. Which of the following would be an appropriate method of assessment? So we are looking for the most appropriate method of assessing. So the way in which to assess the student when reporting progress on an IEP goal that measures the student's ability to understand and use. So not only do they need to be able to understand it, but to be able to use this newly acquired vocabulary. So two things that they have to be able to do understand and use. So let's see which one of these best understands and use. Ask the student to provide two synonyms and two antonyms for each vocabulary word. Ask the student to choose a word 
Wait, choose from a word bank, the vocabulary word that best fits the blanks in a series of sentences. D, ask the student to identify the meaning of previous, oh yeah, various prefixes and suffixes and explain how they change the meaning of the words to which they are affixed. Okay, so I think you're correct. And this is a really great way of getting the students, um, you know, to, in to even increase their writing ability. And um, we use, and this is called sentence frames, where, you know, there you have a, a blank in the middle of it and you have to kind of put it in their sentence frames, a really great way to uh, assess and, um, and for practice purposes for our special ed and our English language learners, right? Whenever we're trying to assess new vocabulary, to get them to place it in a sentence where it makes, you know, it makes sense where, where it goes. And it's a very useful tool for um, both special ed and English learners. So it would be C then. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, good using sentence frames. You see, you got this. Yeah, okay, this one, um, I changed it to A. Mm -hmm. Which organization below specifically provides information to parents, communities, educators, and the general public on specific Disabilities, programs and services for infants, children, and youth, U.S. special education law, and effective educational practices. Okay. Um, it's not American Association of People with Disabilities that's not it? Well, I... I... When I chose it, I, I Googled this one and it oh, was- Oh, you a, did? No, I don't, I don't know. And that's why I'm asking. Oh, I, I Googled it and it said um, for children, like for uh, ages of zero to two to 21. Okay. So and it that's-, does, what, that's yeah, what yeah, you're right. It says infants, children, and youth. Okay, awesome. Yeah, you're right. That's it. And and first and the the only reason why first I chose it was because it had children in it and then I was like let me Google it just in case so I was like mm -hmm. just to know what it means and it said you know uh, the ages and stuff like that and I was like oh okay so Perfect. this sounds like you know a good one oh good okay okay next okay. This one, where am I? Okay, this one, I changed it to B. Okay, you read it for me and tell me how you broke it down. Okay, so following the distribution of periodic IEP uh, goal pro progress reports, the parents of seventh grade students contact Ms. Simpson, a special education case manager, to express concern over her child's lack of progress in her math goal, how should Ms. Simpson respond? First, I had put forward the parents' concerns to a campus administrator and request that mm. they respond. Right. And then, well, that one was wrong. And right. then I changed it to schedule uh, an ARD committee meeting to reevaluate and revise the appropriateness of the student's IEP goals and and supports unless if it's something else because I don't think the first one is is correct which one did you choose I chose uh I changed it to oh crap I'm sorry I changed it to b not c yeah b is the correct answer yeah no, <laughs> b is the correct answer for sure yeah, no, I put uh, provide copies of assignments and tasks used to compile the data of the progress report and explain how the work relates to students' goal while solic soliciting parent input for how to provide better support for the student. 
Yeah, absolutely. You want to be partners in the child's success. And I always try to really sort of convey that to the parents. Like my success is contingent upon your child's success. So if there's something that I can be doing better or, you know, way I'm giving your input, but certainly have the data and show like, these are our goals this is what we're working for. And this is what we're doing to work towards that. Um, and then, but you, you, you don't want to, you know, do a for sure. Um, yeah. And then not see schedule no. mission. No. no, never. Why not? Well, there is a long scheduled list and it gets done. Everybody has to get re-reviewed every year. Um, so that, that shouldn't be the first place that you would go um, to the art committee. Um, because unless you are, um, there's like the specific issues or major changes, you know, and this isn't, this doesn't amount to like, you know, specific issues. Like one of my students, she lost one of her eyes during the school year. She already was special ed and had, and, you know, cause she had a, a, con a, a disorder, a congenital disorder. And so she had several things, but so she lost one of her eyes and we had to do like a special, she'd already had hers, blah, 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 blah. But then now she doesn't have an eye. And so that we have like a whole new set of stuff and we had to reconvene and she got two arts that year. Um, okay. That's terrible. Mm -hmm. So young losing an eye. My grandfather's blind, so. I could imagine a kid. She's an amazing educator right now. She's actually one of my interns in Austin. Oh, I thought she was younger. Oh, okay. She was so much younger. She was in the seventh grade. She was in the seventh grade when this happened to her, but now she's one of my, like now she's a teacher and I go and I, I observe her for her, for her supervision, for her first year of teaching. And she's doing an excellent job. Mm, okay. So Okay, this one I had put C and then I changed it to D. Mm -hmm. So, cause it's most likely to be beneficial to students in other content areas. So I put annotating text to identify key information and concepts. Absolutely, see that's the best because a only works with English, right? That doesn't help with other content areas. Is there going to be poems in math or in science? No. Probably not. Um, the diagramming of the plot of a narrative passage. Again, the plot of a fictional story or a narrative story is not going to be super useful across the content areas. But annotating, identifying, you know, dialoguing with, uh, the text because that's what annotation is is a dialogue it's you saying aha this or I wonder about this or this reminds me of this so it's it's a dialogue and that dialogue can be had in any content area okay okay this one um I had chose c but I changed it to a and I'm still not sure because I don't know. Okay, so. Bring it me, down for me. Yeah, yeah. So to help encourage a third grade student with ADHD to maintain focus and complete assignments, which of the following would be the best approach? Um, I don't think it's B, allow him to choose which assignments he will complete and in which order. Um, I don't think I would allow a student to pick his assignments mm -hmm. and in which order. And then it's obviously not C, remind the student to focus and stay on task with constant verbal reminders. Um, I was thinking D also, 
uh, set a goal for days on task during a six week grading period with a reward at the end. But since he has ADHD, exactly, they get um, ansias. Yeah, like I don't know. I, I've never been, well, no, I have been, but everyone is different where, you know, they uh, pay attention to something else or, you know, start. So I'm like, offer him short term incremental rewards that add up for an opportunity, uh, opportunity to learn, to earn larger rewards, which I'm not sure if, if I mean, I, I am, but I don't know about the rewards part. But it, like, it, uh, I chose it more because it's a short term, you know. Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's a, it's actually kind of a manipulative thing. So I just thought about it right now, but it, it, cause it just reminded me as we were reading through this, but it's sort of breadcrumbing, right? So that's something that like manipulative people do. They, they give you little bits of hope, like a little bit of hope, a little bit of hope, a little bit of hope along the way to keep you moving, right? They give you the little breadcrumbs and hopefully it, it ends in some sort of delicious dessert. Um, if it's not a manipulative thing and it's just purely, uh, motivational, but yeah. what are rewards that like you could offer a student I mean you could have him choose from like the treasure box where there's like an eraser pencil like my kids still and I it's so cute they get so excited with oh Miss Bomber I got blah 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 and so you save tickets and this was something common in elementary, like the teacher would give tickets. If you, if you stayed on task and you completed your assignment, you would get like a little raffle ticket and you could use those as like currency at the end of the week to go sort of shopping into in, in the, the treasure box, right? You put the five tickets in the treasure box and, or in the whatever and you get something from it. So yeah. This is, yeah. Oh, keep now, on. This is better because it, it gives it, it's not like D is wrong because it's like he's not going to get through six weeks on task if he has to wait six weeks to get a reward. Like that's not going to happen. It's just not. And so, um, so maybe giving the ticket, like the ticket or the sticker on your paper is the, is like the mini reward that that's your reward for today. And people don't think like, oh, they think they have to give them something, something. But no, kids love stickers, you know? Yeah, that's really what I, the example I was about to say. I'm like, I've been obsessed with stickers since I was little. And oh I God. still am. I'm 31 and I still am. And and I got I'm my- I'm 40 new- and I still am. Like I, I put them in my planners. Like I, I do- whole- Me too. I and I that. have little ones and I have bigger ones. And I'm like, what are- some things I would love to give the kids you know obviously not candy or stuff like that I was like stickers I was like little stickers or if they do something you know more like this for instance the larger reward can be you know, the I could give you the small stickers and the larger reward can be a bigger sticker exactly so yeah, like, and you know, I I've they, been giving like, away stickers um for well, I've been using them like since ever, like I was a Lisa Frank girl. And so I had stickers out the wazoo since ever, but, um, the students, even high school students, like I had kids from the colonias, um, from everywhere. And they'd be like, miss, I didn't get a sticker on my paper this time. (laughs) Like all super sad. They're 11th graders. And they're like, my and I'm like you didn't even edit your paper you turned it in and I don't know like seven I lost count with the mistakes like no you didn't get a sticker (laughs) but they were sad about it you know I I want my kids to be like that like I want them to be obsessed with stickers the way I am yeah no but they will if you make it a point of it and I mean obviously not everyone but even the ones who really don't care if they're used to you know, doing it. And then one time you, you, they don't meet the bar or, you know, I try to make it to where I can give them a sticker for something that they did positively, especially if they never, ever get it. And see, that's the thing. Some teachers will like give stickers and then, well, like only if you get a hundred, will you get a sticker? Well, then so many few people, like you have to give stickers, like on a, on a 
you know, a gauge type situation, you know, like if you usually score in the twenties on everything in math and now you're doing, you're at like 65, I'm going to give you a sticker. Like, dude, you are doing so much better. You were at 20 and now we're at 65. Like you get over 70. I might give you two stickers on that thing. I don't know, (laughs) you know, and then they get excited, but you have to sort of give them that, that excitement and, uh, and do it consistently. Right. If you give stickers once in a blue moon, then they're like, eh, whatever. Um, but if they come to expect it and they get, mine would get excited. Cause I would order like, you would like, I have stickers with my kids' names on them because in my planner, I'm like, uh, you know, sort of like very particular with my planner and the stuff that I do in it. But like, even my kids, like I, I don't know if you can, oh, you can't see it, but I special order um, stickers and the kids would get excited if I got any stickers. Then you got any stickers? Yes. Can we see them? No, you're going to have to wait and see if they end up on your, your stuff. But there's, I mean, kids are really cute. And even the big ones, they're just kids, you know? Um, and, and far too often people forget that when they, they're teaching, you know, they either weren't told that and weren't never thought of it that way. You know, they think of it as a job. So it's like, if you work at a fast food restaurant, your customers are customers, you really don't think anything beyond it, but our job is not only the act of teaching daily, but our product, which is our effect on a human like a real human that has fears and hopes and desires and familial issues that are completely out of their control you know financial issues that are completely out of their control and then they have these adults that sort of expect them to just sort of march and step and do five times seven and sometimes there's too much and their little brains are a barely growing and b not equipped to deal with traumas and traumas are really anything that like affects them adversely so um i wish the public understood how important our job is and how terribly like nuanced and challenging and you know and important um, cause I, I so often hear people disparage teaching, but I am so proud to be a teacher. Like I have two master's degrees. I'm sort of an expert in many fields, but I wouldn't do anything else than what I'm doing right now, because I think it's very important. Wow. I, congratulations on having two masters. That's. Oh, I, thank you so much. I eventually want to, it's going to, uh, yeah, I, graduated in 2014 but I was my father's caregiver until he passed away um oh I'm so sorry I was, uh, until I was 30 and um I was like I I got my bachelor's in psychology and I was like well you know what can I do with it you know and I was like right. I, I I have a caregiving heart you know, so I was like, do I want to go back to school? I was like, no, you know, like I need to find something. So I was like, and I've always thought about being a special education teacher because it's just, and I, this is where it's going to be difficult to explain job interview. It's like, they're going to ask, why did, why do you want to be a special education teacher? And how can I say it? You know, it's literally because I, not only was I a caregiver to my father, but to my grandfather and my aunt who had cancer, my, I would help my mom. So it was a 24 seven thing. So, um, it's like, I have a, like this weakness, like this caring heart for, well, I think that you should say it just like that, you know, most of my life has been devoted to caring for people with special needs, you know, and that's people, caring for in their end of life, you know, uh, needs and all of that. And so I think that you are actually perfectly equipped for this position and all of the things that you just said, they're not inconsequential. They are evidence of experience for this job. So make sure that you, that you certainly um, mention that when you are in an interview, why are you doing this? I do this because I've had to do over the course of, you know, however many years take care of various family members and it's something that you know 
you know, gives you, uh, that it's meaningful to you, you know, yeah. that you find meaning in and that you think that is incredibly important. And to be able to do that for students in the education system, you know, I think it would be an amazing profession. You know, I feel like we should get medals. I don't know. I'm going to petition Biden. It's just a lot of people, a lot of, um, I've talked to family members, my family is extremely educated. You know, mm -hmm. I'm talking about lawyers and doctors mm -hmm. and directors. And I always consider myself the black sheep because I was a caregiver of the family. Mm -hmm. So it's like when, and I talked to my cousin, he, he's a, a therapist and he's just like, you know, being a caregiver, a lot of employers look down on that. He's like, it doesn't seem like a real job. Like, and I was like, well, it is. I was like, but it's just if you haven't experienced it. No, it absolutely is a job. It absolutely. And it, and, it, and it's a job that is very akin to um, inclusion, not inclusion. Uh, what is it called? When you have the students that are in um, in the contained unit, you know what I mean? You will be changing, uh, you know, all diapers you will be um there will be drooling there will like there will be it, you'll have to do loads of laundry while you're there as well um if you are in that unit so it's very comparable to this particular I understand what they're saying and I get it and that's just like ignorance of people not knowing everything that goes entail into you know <clears throat> caring for someone who cannot care for themselves in normal daily functions. It's incredibly taxing. I mean, just, it's, it's a lot. Um, the medicines and then, and then um, you have the education, the, your EPP program. And so you're able to uh, go into the classroom and you would be a perfect, if I were your administrator and I was an administrator, I would hire you. I mean, because I know that your qualifications would absolutely, um, you know, suit the position of someone in special ed. So I, I think you should mention it um, and, and just say that that's why you didn't, you know, you can even take the time, make yourself personable, tell them about yourself. I, I want to go on and, you know, continue my education, but I had to be a caregiver for my family. So that had to be on hold. And I enjoyed caring for people that I loved. And I wanted to find a profession that allowed me to continue to care, you know, for people and give back. And this is it. <laughs> yeah, that that's just what it is. I was like, because my mom had asked, like, well, what do you want to do with your life? You know, like, what's that career that you want to go to? And I'm just like, I kept, I was like, well, it has to do something with like mental health. I was like, or something I was like I, I have to take care of someone that's my immediate reaction to anything I was like who needs help you know uh because I've been used to that for a decade almost right. you know so which was all my 20s you know everyone's 20s are different my 20s was let's you know get you to the hospital let's you know things like that and help them with daily life skills and things like that um but yeah but that, that's why I, i'm choosing yeah that's why i'm choosing this field because i think i would be and i'm i'm very excited but i'm also a little i'm like i hope the kids like me they will they absolutely will you're gonna have a whole bunch of strange kids calling you mom and it, like I feel bad because I have my kids and I'd be I would want to die if my children were calling another woman mom but you know some kids don't either they don't have a mom or they have a very strained relationship or their mom is like not there because they work all the time or whatever the case may be but when you make a connection with the kids they they just they start calling you mom and it always made me sad, you know, to think that they needed someone like that or else they wouldn't call out for it. They wouldn't call someone else because my daughter would never call someone else. Mom. <laughs> you know, I um, don't have kids, so it's, um, call me mom. It's fine. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm saying that my but um, it, it's it's nice to know that you are that kind of person for them when they do say that it's it's because 
you give them something that resembles what mom is supposed to be like. And so it always makes me a little bit sad because it means that they're missing something at home, but I'm happy to um, be there to give it to them um, while they're at school. And I think that you're going to do just that. You're going you're gonna to be amazing. The kids are going to love you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, keep on. Um, okay. Uh, so this one uh, I had, uh, it was a, it was wrong. And then I had changed it to B. All right. So identify for me the keywords and phrases that you said, uh, you know, you need to pay attention to. So, okay. So during independent reading time, a teacher walks around and holds a mini book, holds mini book con, con, conferences, sorry, uh, with each student. She asks basic comprehension questions like what's happening now or how did the character respond to X while conferencing with Jane, the teacher has trouble getting Jane to relate anything that has happened other than the characters names in order to help Jane succeed. What is the first step the teacher should take so. It's not A, and B, it's um, Jane's current reading level and compare the reading level of the text she's currently reading to text that she has read previously. Or, and then C is Jane's current reading level and make sure the text is not at her instructional reading level. And I know we went through this the other day, instructional, independent instructional and uh, frustration frustrational and um th that's what the other one is is the independent okay so uh assess jane's current reading level and make sure the text is not above her independent reading level um above her independent reading level. What's above independent reading? Independent's the highest that you can go. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? First, next. Uh, we're not going to, um, we don't want it to be above her. Make sure that the, Make sure that the text is not at her instructional level. Okay, yeah, we want it to be at her independent because independent reading, we, want, we don't want it to be at her instructional level. We want it to be at her in, in, independent. I'm like, why is this so hard for me? But this one is above frustration and, not, and I can see why you chose that. But this one is at instructional, not at instructional, which means in, uh, independent, right? And this one is not above independent, um, which there's nothing above independent. So I would say uh, C is the correct answer. C. So instructional reading level. Okay. Okay, so this one, I had changed it to C. I think okay. that one's the best one. Okay, so dissect it for me. Tell me your, your thought process. Okay, so he, Reagan is a, he's a ninth grade student with a specific learning disability in reading comprehension. During Reagan's, um, that's how you pronounce it, right, Reagan? Yeah. annual IEP meeting her father requests that she be dismissed from special education services since her last report card showed A's and B's in all core classes the most appropriate response to Reagan's father is to okay so really quickly um if she's doing well that means that the support that she's being given is working yeah um so she is ninth grade reading comprehension. And so I get the desire to 
Um, but it's only one report card. Her yeah. last report she card, she has A's it. and B's. And that just shows the supports are, are working and she's thriving. She's being masterful, succeeding in her learning experience with the support. And I would think it would be terrible to remove her because th that would remove all the support. So that said, read for me your thought process with the answer choices. So agree with him and recommend that Reagan no longer receive special special education services no i'm sorry my dog is barking no, hey, no, no. no shh be quiet uh okay uh no because um i think the special it first like we said oh, i am so sorry hold on no, no, no. hold on. let me just let her out of the room because okay so it's not a because she just started uh getting good scores and then i wouldn't want to remove i chose the other one because i wouldn't want to remove her because it's obviously helping her get a's and b's right so it's working it's working her the the special education and assistance is helping her get good grades yeah her support and accommodations are working right yeah so I, that's why i changed it to c and yeah, c point I out that the classroom accommodation that would yeah and d will uh, recommend moving Reagan out of her inclusion classes and into advanced classes so she would have access to more challenging curriculum, which is no, because like we said, she just started getting A's and B's. Let's have her, you know, why would we want to challenge her more if she just started? It's not like if she right. has so like a lot of more report cards uh, saying uh, with A's and B's because the next report card can change to lower grades or. Exactly. And so maybe after a year or a semester and she gets all A's in her classes, well, maybe she would she would do well in an advanced class. Maybe she would. And, and but after an extended period of time, you know, um, with the input of the teacher, the content area teacher, you know what I mean? Like um, who has to also give input because um, on, on, you know, the, the student's progress. So yeah, definitely um, point out that the classroom accommodations are working and are likely contributing to her academic success and that she might struggle or regress without the support. So that would be the first thing that I would say. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this one, did I answer it or not? Hold on. Okay, this one, I was, I put a question. I thought it was either, it's either A or <clears throat> D. A formative assessment is intended to, I'm going to read all of them, determine the efficacy of a method of instruction. It does not determine if, uh, I mean... I guess it could, if you looked at the data, you could see how effective your instruction was if all of your data shows you that the students didn't understand anything. Assess a student's progress when compared to that of non-disabled peers. Definitely not. Assess a student's overall developmental capability. No, we use formative assessments all the time. We use them before and during learning and they're used to shape our instruction. They form or drive the design of our instruction, right? To let us know what they need. Um, we do like pre-testing type things before a unit to see what do they know before we start a unit to see what do I have to introduce? What do I have to go over? Measure learning at various incremental po points with a larger unit of study. And I would say that um, it does D and it also can do A. But is it only one answer? It's one answer choice, right? Yeah. So I would say D, it's intended to measure the learning. We, we give formative assessments to measure the student learning. Um, and, and then if we, in the measurement, see that, oh man, like 80% of the kids didn't understand, 
how to identify tone in a poem. Well, then I need to check my method of instruction. The efficacy of my instruction is off. If, if after looking at my data of my formative assessments, um, it, it's shown that, that the students are not being successful. So, but, but it's intended to measure learning. We measure learning and it, that formative assessment helps us form our um, plan, our design. Where, where do we go now based on what they know? Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to go. I think that's the end of our five hours together. Okay, um, I was going to ask you, um, do you have any more hours available? Like two more hours just so um, I'll finish the exam questions, sure, but sure. also that, that hour can be for that. And then um, another hour can be just you telling me, you know, basics or rules or yeah, like best practices and uh, going over the EL stuff. Yeah. So do you have two hours available uh, before May 3rd? For sure. Let me let me look at my calendar right now. I need a new notebook. So you test on Tuesday? Yes. At eight okay. in the morning. Well, at eight in the morning? Okay. Um, did you want to do um one on Sunday and then eleven on Monday? So an hour on Sunday and then an hour on Monday? Yes. Okay, so at both of them at 11? Well, I was thinking, can we do Monday at 1? Because my daughters leave with their dad at noon. So okay. I want to make sure they're... Yeah, so on Monday, it could be like just what to prepare before the exam. You know, For sure, things. going over best practices. Because the day before the exam, I don't want you to do too much studying. Because like I told you before, this above all else is a critical reading exam. It is a critical reading exam with large scenarios and, and nuanced language, technical language, you know, that, that is connected to theory, you know. So um, it, it's the equivalent of a marathon, a, a cognitive marathon. You know, people before a marathon really rest up, they rest their body, they eat well, you know, they they visualize their success or, or like the path that they're going to go. And so that's kind of what I want you to do the day before. I want for you to, um, we'll have our session at 11, like normal on Monday. And then afterwards, I really just want for you to just de decompress, um, have a good meal, you know, wake up, um, visualize you going in there and kicking butt, visualize you, you going in there, identifying key terms, concepts, the, the main goal, you know, using um, logic and process, you know, your process of elimination when necessary and, and um, being mindful of the time too, because you don't want to run out of time. Yeah. So don't, don't, uh, once you get it down to those two answer choices, if you think uh, you know, you're having difficulty, you remind yourself it's something in the words. One of these addresses the key uh, words and phrases or the key concept or so delivers on the teacher's goal better than the other. And that one, it has to be the right answer. Okay. So I'll send you the 150 right now when we end our session. And then we have a meeting at 3, 3.30, right, today? That's correct. We have a, a group meeting at three. Do you and I'll, go, I'll go over some over I'm going to go over some overarching things, too. So it'll be useful for you. Do you mind if I um asked if they want to be like in a study group? Um, sure. No, I don't at all. Like, not I don't say, if, does anyone want to be like join a study group? And I'll just put my email and my phone number um, that way 
you know, no, not at all. Absolutely. You, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I just wanted to get your approval first. So, um, yeah, absolutely. thank you for helping me so much. I'm a lot more confident. It's been my pleasure. I'm so glad. And I honestly think that you will be a wonderful addition to the noble profession of teaching. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good to hear. So um, I will, I'll see you at 3.30 and then on Sunday at 11. I'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah. On Sunday at 11 and then Monday at 1.00. No, 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 no. But Sunday at one and Monday oh. at 11. Oh, I got it wrong. Thanks for, so Monday at 11, right? And yes, Sunday at one. Okay, that's good. Okay, then I guess I'll see you at three. I'm gonna go to lunch and I'll see you in a couple of hours. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And this, let me see what am I doing? What am I doing?